A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, we are the circumcision, we who worship through the Spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus and do not put our confidence in flesh, although I myself have grounds for confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he can be confident in flesh, all the more can I. Circumcised on the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage, in observance of the law of Pharisee. In zeal, I persecuted the church. In righteousness, based on the law, I was blameless. But whatever gains I had, these I have come to consider a loss because of Christ. More than that, I even consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The word of the Lord. Let hearts rejoice who search for the Lord. Sing to him, sing his praise, proclaim all his wondrous deeds, glory in his holy name, rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek to serve him constantly. Recall the wondrous deeds that he has wrought, his portents and his judgments he has uttered. You descendants of Abraham, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he, the Lord, is our God. Throughout the earth, his judgments prevail. Dominus Fabescum. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus addressed this parable to them. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having 10 coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Verbum Domini.
Today, in the first reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul speaks about, I think, the fulfillment in Christ, observance of the old law, all, all its cultic practices as a sign pointing to Jesus where it is fulfilled in Christ. And he speaks today of circumcision and he says, we are the circumcision, we who worship through the spirit of God. Remember circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign of being a member of the people of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse six, there's this big exhortation in this third sermon of Moses in Deuteronomy to keep the law, especially the first commandment, that I am the Lord your God, do not have false gods before me. He said, the Lord God will gather you and from there he will fetch you from this promised land that he, he's intending his people to dwell on. And he says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So already there in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy speaks of this circumcision of the heart, this gathering of his people, even though they're, you know, after they go to the promised land, even though they might be scattered or, or break the covenant, he will gather this people. He will circumcise your heart. Colossians uh, chapter two says the spirit, spiritual circumcision of the heart is performed in baptism, that this is where this takes place, the justification we receive in baptism, the forgiveness, the cleansing of sins, you know, having the Holy Spirit given to us or made temples of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 2, 29, real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal. And even, of course, in the Old Testament, you know, the prophets would rail against the people that it's not just the external signs, it's necessary to live the morality of the of the law, the Ten Commandments. But the point is, is that circumcision prefigures baptism in Christ, the sacrament of faith. So it's through faith and baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, that we are saved, that we're gathered as the, the people of God, gathered in Jesus, that we receive these blessings of this new promised land, so to speak, in Christ and ultimately in heaven. You know, as St. Catherine of Siena said, I think, you know, we receive earnest money on this payment of eternal life, you know, in this world, in this life, through our relationship with Jesus. So Paul's telling us that circumcision, he uses the phrase, was in the flesh, but we can't put our confidence in the flesh. We can't just put our confidence in observance of the law but in Jesus and what he has done for us in the Paschal Mystery. I can't be saved without faith. I can't be saved by my works alone. I am saved through faith in Jesus and those blessings poured upon us in the sacraments. So Paul goes through, which he's very good at, <laughs> this litany of how he has observed the law. You know, if anyone would have confidence in his works and in the flesh, so to speak, it would be Paul. He was, we're told today, he was circumcised on the eighth day as prescribed in the law, that he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, that he is a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage, that he was zealous for the law, persecuting Christians who he thought was violating the law. He was righteous in the law. All these gains, all these observances though, he says in this most poetic phrase, all of it considered loss because of Christ. Because those are the, the signs and we have the fulfillment in Jesus. So all considered loss because of Christ. Jesus fulfills the law, all those cultic practices and signs. As he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, he does not abolish the moral prescriptions of the law, the Ten Commandments, but he actually deepens their obligations upon us and calls upon us an even deeper observance, you know, aiming at reforming the heart, not just committing adultery, but not lusting, not just not committing murder, but also not 
hating our brothers and sisters. You know, his fulfillment is a true trans transformation and renewal of the inner man. So we have sign and then reality in Jesus. So circumcision is a sign of this purification of the heart that's to take place in which we can offer true worship in the Holy Spirit to the Father in Jesus, that we are justified, you know, made new creatures in Christ, really transformed. I mean, baptism, not just an outward sign, but a real transformation of the inner man, that we were given promise, have the first fruits, pledge of eternal life, that in this life, in this world, we can come to see and know I mean, in the, in the eternal life, we have that fullness of seeing and knowledge of Jesus, but we can have that real relationship with him in this life, in this world that begins now. But in heaven, it goes beyond. We're, we're free from the limitations of a fallen human nature, flesh, that we can have perfect love and knowledge of God. You know, versus the limitations we experience now in relationships. You know, we have... You know, we can go into a relationship with self-centeredness or bias or project onto them, impute things onto them that aren't really true. We send, see people sometimes through the lens of our own self-centeredness. We're blinded by sin. We're experiencing a darkened intellect and a weakened will. So all that's, you know, all that's taken away in heaven. We can have this fullness of knowledge. So eternal life fulfills our desire to know and to love. It fulfills all our desires, all that we want, versus the image that we receive or we can see, experience down here. Real, it's certainly real, but it's, it's limited, and it's not the fullness on earth. This is a very weak, weak analogy, but it's a food analogy, so I take it seriously. <laughs> it's like... You know, it's like eating a processed meal out of a package versus one cooked for you with fresh ingredients that's healthy. It's like just staying in a candy store. You know, it's an image of just eating candy, like living for sense, pleasures, and experiences versus a healthy, beautifully prepared meal that has a cultural expression to it, you know, all the different foods that we go around the world, you know, a, a beautiful meal. You know, this is, you know, this is what we find in Jesus in our relationship to know and to love him. You know, it's like perpetually dating versus being married, you know, to enter into the fullness of the relationship where we can give more and receive more. So Paul adds, you know, the last sentence today, he says, you have the gains of the law, fulfillment of Christ. But he says, more than that, I even consider everything as loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything, not just the law. Everything is lost. That Jesus is greater than the world and everything in it. All the great, beautiful things in the world are signs, in a sense, that point to a fulfillment in Christ. Everything is lost compared with, having, compared with having Jesus in our life. The supreme good of knowing him, of having him, that we can have a peace that the world does not give, that we can have a joy that the flesh cannot produce in us, that we can have victory over sin and death. I mean, we can have, by his grace, we can overcome the horrible experience of sin, of being lost in the darkness, that we can walk by his light, by walk by his spirit, that we can know a, a fulfillment and meaning to our life. That as Christians, we don't have to be searching for meaning, that we know in Jesus we have that meaning. Now, it doesn't mean we don't experience a desire. I think that desire for a fullness and meaning is a good thing. It, it urges us on to find even more of Christ, to have even deeper relationship with him. 
but we're experiencing a certain satisfaction, a certain fulfillment of that desire in him, you know, in this life. That everything in our life is done in relationship to Jesus. That everything is charged with meaning. That even our sufferings taken up in Christ are redemptive, makes us holy, and can be salvific for others. That's meaning in life, right? That even frustrations, failures, everything taken to Jesus, he can draw some good out of them. And they can have some meaningful purpose in our life. What about from Jesus' perspective, if we look at what his heart experiences for us? And I think we're told that in the gospel, that, that Jesus goes after the lost sheep, that he leaves the 99, brings it home with great joy, and it's not even enough for the shepherd himself just to have that joy, but he gathers the neighbors together, right, to celebrate this that's joy are the parable jesus gives us in the gospel the ten coins that this woman experiences great urgency to find this lost coin this one of the ten and sweeps the whole house with a lamp got to find it now you know gets it and this is all a big setup for the parable of the prodigal son this beautiful parable where the father watches the horizon and and runs out to the sun when he sees him finally coming home. So Jesus himself, in his heart, considers all as lost if he does not have you and I in his kingdom. He considers it lost. He doesn't say that, but those what the images of these parables are, the urgency, the desire of the heart of Christ for us. That you know, he is the shepherd who goes out in search of his of the lost sheep, leaving the ninety-nine, you know, to bring it back. That he's not satisfied with having ninety-nine, without you know, just having a I might the flock's big enough, I don't need, I can lose one. He has this desire for each one of us, that desires us with all his heart to be part of his kingdom. As we know that, that it's lost without Jesus, Jesus, I think, in some way experiences this loss without us, without us being part of his kingdom. You know, that he greatly desires to have this relationship to share eternal life with us.